Huh? At least you wasn't in the kitchen. Huh? At least you wouldn't have been in the kitchen, Nate. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I believe that was the Lord, Carla. Huh? I believe that was the Lord. Yeah. I really did. Yes. Sometimes the Lord says strange things to us. Yeah. And I love the Lord.
this Sunday for the following Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Wait for tomorrow. Okay. You got plans with your grandchildren for next week. I'll be all right. I'll, I'll, I'll come. Okay. Okay. Don't know where the church is and everything. They're saying, I'll go back next week. Go back next week. So, I tell you this message. I, he's an on time God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Ain't that the truth? Mm-hmm. We're going to be in Exodus 3. He's an on time God. Exodus 3, 10 through 17. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth the people of the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, ye so, uh, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt thou shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all your generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, hears them be saying, I have surely visited you, and yes. have seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I, have, and I have said, I will bring you up out of this affliction of Egypt, and under the land of Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Amen. He said he was, he was the I am. Boy, that's an interesting you know, there's lots of different lots of different names for God, but that's an interesting one. Amen. You know, it's interesting when the when the scribes, you know, the scribes were the, the group of, of men that wrote the actual scrolls, you know. When they would write God's name, when they would write I am, they didn't write it very much, but when they wrote it in the scrolls, they would write the name and they'd throw the pen the, the quill away and they'd get a new one. But they would never write another word with that quill. It only said God's name once and then they got rid of it. It was such a sacred thing. As a matter of fact, they really didn't like to write God's name unless it was in the scriptures. Because they had their traditions that once you wrote God's name, that's holy. And you can't get rid of it. And you can't destroy it. And I, I was thinking back to you know, when I was a kid, we used to have that same thing in the churches, man. You didn't, you didn't get rid of the Bible. You know, you didn't burn it, you didn't throw it in the trash, you didn't let it touch the ground. I remember my parents, oh man, I'd been in trouble. If I, I, I throw the Bible in the dirt, I'd have been in a lot of trouble. You don't see that much anymore. Yeah, yeah. But people people reverence the Bible in a way that you know that we don't really do that today. And I'm not sure why the church got away from that. But sometimes when they would write it, they would it was kind of neat. Where they would like say if they wanted to write I am, they'd write I dash you know. Yeah. Or they would put if they wanted to say God, they put G dash B. Okay, instead of writing the full name of God. And it was just a way of, of reverence. If it wasn't going into the scriptures, like say if it was going to go into a song or something, they would write G dash or G dash D. You know, it was kind of interesting, but they they really reverence God. Amen. They really reverence. And that's kind of gone. You know, God reveals his name to Moses. He says, I'm the, I, I am that I am. And he tells him he's heard the cries of the people. And uh, and then he says, I am is going to deliver that name. In verse 22, you see, uh, Every woman shall borrow of his neighbor, and of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver, and jewels of gold, and raiment, and you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you shall spoil the Egyptians. So we see there, the scripture saying that, you know, when, when they're going to leave Egypt, amen, they're going to take everything with it. They're going to take the gold, they're going to take the silver. They're going to take the clothes. And how many know that clothes are worth a lot of money? I mean, clothes are worth a lot of money back there, so it wasn't a small thing just to take some of his clothes. It was a lot of money. God says he will deliver you, and he will and he, you will spoil the Egyptians' wealth and take all that with you. He says when he has to save the Egyptians, and then everybody goes to bed, the Egyptians all die, and, and Israel takes everything and leaves, right? No. That's not how it worked. I mean, there's quite a few things that had to happen. It didn't quite work that way. But it sure would have been nice, wouldn't it, you know, if they didn't have to go through all the struggles they had to leave. 
If, if, if they just died in their sleep and Israel picked up everything left, it's been simple need. There's no plus, there's no must, no way of doing it. But, you know, how I many know that God's ways, you know, He don't always look at things the same way we do. Amen. And He don't, His plans are not always the way that, that our mind would conceive our plans. You know, we, we want our way and we want it the way we want it. We want it yesterday. Amen. And then that, that's, and the God says, no, that's not, that's not how God does things. And you know, he has a lot of reasons why he, why he does that. I and mean, we, we, we couldn't really explain every one of them. But you know, you can't put God in a box, I always say. And what happens if you put God in a box? He breaks out. I mean, he, he can't be contained in a box. You know, the scripture says that our thoughts are not his thoughts, and our ways are not his ways. And they're so much higher above us. Anybody know how long it took Moses to convince Pharaoh to leave Israel? Or to leave Egypt? Anybody have any idea? I mean, it don't specifically say, but we know that when Moses went back to Egypt, he was 80, okay? And we know that he died at 120, okay? So there's, and they wandered in the, and they wandered in the, in the, in the uh, desert for 40 years. So it was definitely under a year, definitely way under a year, because there was only 40 years in there, and he was in the desert 40 years, Scripture says. But, so he's there, uh, the, the, and we know because of the, the plagues that, with all the crops, if you read the different plagues, okay, and, and it says in there that we know it was that all them plagues was approximately two months. It could have been 40 days. Traditionally, the Jews say it was 40 days, but it was roughly two months. And why we know that? Because it, it says that the flax and the barley it was destroyed, okay? And we know that in the Holy Land, they mature around February. They mature around February, and, and then a couple months later, the locusts come and destroy the wheat, and that's about two months later. So we know it was roughly around a two, a two month to 40, to 40 day period in there. That was a short couple of verses in there, but we're really revealing to what was going on there and how long it took that whole process to take place. You know, before Moses, before Moses came back to Israel, when he was in Egypt, excuse me, Israel was in Egypt 430 years. So they was in bondage, they was in slavery 430 years. Before Moses come back, that was a long time, you know. And so that, I look at that and think, man, that kind of puts a monkey wrench in our notion of how long God should take to deliver us, to give us what we think we need. Amen. He's got a different timeline than we do. You know, God delivered, God delivered me from this mess that I'm in, and delivered me like yesterday. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> yeah, you ever been that way? I've been that way. And so I guess sometimes when I get desperate, I'm still that way in prayer. <laughs> But, you know, I always ask myself a question. I do. I ask myself this question. Well, if, if God was to deliver me right now from the mess that I'm in right now, what am I going to do? You know, yeah, am I ready to be delivered? And, and for whatever caused me to get into that mess, am I ready to get rid of that out of my life? You know? We've got to ask ourselves because God just, just to have God just to deliver us from whatever mess we're in, if we're not, if our heart's not ready, to get rid of whatever garbage and junk that God's trying to filter out of our life, delivering us isn't going to do us any good. Amen. Really, what we need to do is back in the body again until we get it out of our system. But if you read uh, after every play, you know, the scripture says that Pharaoh is going to let him go. And what, what happens is really kind of unique. What happens is that scripture says that God comes back and pardons his heart, pardons his heart, you know. So, really, I mean, you could say it's kind of a people kind of, yeah, they get kind of, when you say it, but, you know, really, God manipulated him and, and did with him what he chose, you know. But, you know, we know in the scriptures that we have free will to choose salvation or be damned, you know. But really, beyond that, God can pretty much do whatever he wants to do. And if, if there's some reason he wants to harden our heart, you know, after after that, and do something with us, and that's his liberty to do what he wants to do. And if he wants to soften our heart, then he'll soften our heart. It's all it's all his good pleasure and his good will. A lot of people, ah, I should be able to do whatever I want to. Well, yeah, you you can do whatever you want to when it comes to salvation. But if God really wants to put His hand in it, He's going to have His way, <laughs> regardless of what you think or what you want. If God wants to, you know, God could have just struck Egypt down. Israel could have just walked away. You know, God chooses to do things differently. Amen. And if you look at the whole story of, 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 of uh, Israel and Egypt and the Pharaoh and the Egyptians, it was really as much about Israel as it was about the Egyptians. You know, 
It was about, the, about Israel learning lessons and learning something. And I, and I believe it was for us also later when it was recorded. We can come back and read it. It was for us. You know, pretty much Egypt's fate was, it was already determined. It was, it was determined before Moses was born. Amen. But if you read the scripture, there is some, there is some people in there that it talks about after Egypt that were saved. And you, you, know, you can read that like in, a, in a Exodus 9.20. I'll go ahead and read that. <coughs> Exodus 9.20. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the house. Now what's going on here? God is going to send this, this uh, plague down and all the cattle are going to die. And he tells them to take the cattle and put them in the house. <coughs> put the cattle in the house and they will die. So what it's saying here is that some of the servants of Pharaoh feared the Lord. And what did they do? They took their cattle. And they, and they took their, their master's cattle and they put them in the house. They were spared. So, you know, how many know that God has a remnant everywhere? And even in Egypt, God had a remnant. It's kind of interesting that he had that remnant there. Israel was in bondage 430 years, but God was right, right on time. Amen. He was right on time. He was right on time to teach Israel and later to teach us through the scriptures, life lessons, how to live, and also the grace and mercy of the Lord. Amen. Because what did God do? I mean, God really showed his grace and his mercy on Israel at that time. And then some some had judgment and, and, and some, but he was faithful to do, you know, on some, his mercy. And he was faithful to do all that he promised. Maybe not in the in the way that we look at being faithful and in the, in the time period that we think that God should do it, but he was faithful. Scripture says he's faithful to do what he promises. So if he promises something, he's going to do it. It might not be in our time frame, but it is going to happen. Amen. Might not be in our time. And that's a, that's a hard one to struggle with. I mean, you know, we, we, we got this notion in our mind how God's going to do things sometimes. And, that's, and then when it don't come that way, we, we really get crushed. We're going to turn to Daniel 3. We're going to turn to Daniel 3. It's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. That's a good, good story. Amen. In the fiery furnace, that's right. Baby. Amen. A fourth man in the fire. That's right. That was Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Three sixteen through twenty eight. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, "O oh, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. But if it be so, our God, who we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship thy golden image which thou hast set up." Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated, so they heated it up seven times more than they normally did. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore came the king's commandment with urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men had them bound, and they're going to cast them in the fire, and they opened the doors. The men that took them, that were going to push them in, they were burned up. Amen. But not, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto King, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning furnace, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. Amen. Yes. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose body the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed, neither was their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had it passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel, and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Amen. Boy, that's a wonderful story. I love, I love. I've that since I was a little kid. Amen. 
you know, we, we all know that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they played the music, you read this as they played the music, you fall down and you worship that golden idol, you know, the big giant golden idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they just refuse and say, yeah, that's not going to happen, boys. And the king threatens their life, you know. So what happens? They pray, and God kills all the heathens, and Israel, and they all left victorious, right? No. No. That's not what happened. Uh, the king got mad, and what does he do? He binds them, he makes the fire seven times hotter, and throws them in there, and then he throws them in there to burn them up. But you know, that's not the way it happened, because God had other plans, amen, just like he did with the Israelites in Egypt. He had other plans. It'd be nice if it just worked out that way, you know, if instead of getting thrown in the fire, God could just deliver them, amen, before the furnace. Because I, you know, I'll be honest, I don't really think they want to go into that furnace. <laughs> Would you? Well, I, I know I don't, amen. I don't want to get thrown in no furnace. You know, I'm sure there, there, was, some, there was some concern and there was some worry in their, in their mind. And I look at it like, you know, God, did I really hear your voice, you know? God, are you really going to be with me? You know, that's what I've been thinking, amen. Did they really, you know, did they really hear the word of the Lord in these matters? That's what I'd be thinking before I got thrown in there. But uh, verse uh, 17 and 18. Let's see here. I got to go back on page 17 and 18. But if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Amen. Yes. You know, God, God's going to deliver us. Amen. He will. And if we get into the, in, in the fiery furnace, God's going to deliver us. And, you know, but we can say, you know, even if he don't, we're not going to bow. Amen. And we won't bow. Even if, even if God don't deliver us, we're not going to bow. This weekend, I went and visited my youngest sister up north, up on Lake Erie. And she said, oh, come. I want you to come to my church. I said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. So I packed up and man, it was a big church. We had three services. The one that we was in was about 500 people. So they, you know, they had 1,500, 2,000 people in that church. It was a big church, big church. And I was sitting there. I was listening. Up. I believe it was the youth pastor was preaching. And I heard the Lord, I heard the Lord say something. He says, uh, the persecution comes to this church. That church right there. He said, How many people will bow? I said, Oh Lord. Uh -oh. And you know, I, I, I really didn't have to think that long. I, I answered pretty quickly. I said, Lord, I believe most of them will bow. I really do. And uh, you know, He never answered me one way or the other. <laughs> We're talking about how God says peculiar things to you, you know. A lot of times He says peculiar things to me, and, I, and I'll answer them. When he asks me a question, but I'm waiting for a response back. And a lot of times I don't get a response back. I didn't get a response back that time either. Anyway. But uh, I was being set up, and I'll explain it in a minute. But I said, Lord, I think I believe most of them was about. But you know, I was encouraged by that church. I'll be honest with you. I, I listened to the, to the youth pastor, and then he preached the gospel. He, he preached Jesus crucified, you know, resurrected, and salvation through, through Jesus Christ. And then he even preached a little bit of holiness. I mean, it wasn't. Kind of cut around the borders of it, but there was a little bit. Of, I was encouraged by that. You know, they at least you know, there is some. There is some of the gospel being preached there, anyways. I I I, I don't have very much the big big churches. A lot of my going to, and uh, I don't have very good lives out of a lot of you know. There's just not a lot of money there. But I was, you know, I was I was surprised. I would say that you know, there, at least God was being preached there. And then, but uh, but. You know, I said, well, how many of them, you know, a lot of, I figured, well, you know, Lord, yeah, probably a lot of them would fall away, and those that ain't already in apostasy. And, uh, you know, you ever thought, what does it mean to be an apostasy? I mean, you ever thought, thought what, what does that word really mean? If someone says, oh, you're apostate, because I see that a lot. I mean, I, 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 one Christian calls another Christian apostate, and I'm like, really? Really? You really think that person's apostate? And I don't, because I don't, they, I've heard people call another Christian apostate, and I said, I don't think that Christian's apostate, but I really don't. Basically, in the scripture, what it means to be apostate is that you, know, you, you turn away from, from doctrine and conduct, amen, from the scriptures in a way that will deny Jesus as a Christ, amen, even to that point. You know, you, 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 
turn away from sound doctrine and you turn away from good conduct. That's really what needs to be apostate here in scriptures. And having a different opinion about a scripture, that doesn't make you apostate. That just means you have a different opinion than they do, okay? And that doesn't mean you can't just tell somebody they're apostate because they don't believe the same way you do. A lot of times you're careful because you're going to find out you're wrong and they're right. <laughs> and you know, that's how it's been for me in my life, anyways. But, you know, I come up later, I was at home and I was listening to one of my sermons that I recorded. And I mean, you know, that's, it's, that's a little weird. Yeah. It is a little I listen to my sermons, but it, it's still a little weird. Every time I do it, it's just, it's just a little weird listening to yourself. <coughs> But I do it. I don't know why. I just do it. Sometimes I critique myself, see mistakes I made, what can I do, you know, that kind of thing. But the Lord asked me again, he says, you know, you, you record your sermons for a bunch of people. He said, you know, are you going to bow if they come from you? Oh. You know, I wasn't so quick to answer that one. Yeah, I, the first question he asked me earlier that day, I was real quick to answer. But that one kind of me for a loop or anything. And I, and I finally told the Lord, I said, yeah, I believe I am, Lord. I said, if I wasn't, then I wouldn't be putting them on the internet. And then, at least I better not be. And he made, he better, if, if, you know, if you're going to put something out there for, for to be recorded and like that, you better you better be, be ready for whatever might come. And I don't know what to say. If, if, if you're not, I don't know what to say if you're doing that. But, uh, you know, I mean, you know, you know, I lost my face or anything. I, you know, I always pray that that I never have to face that kind of thing, you know, that kind of persecution. Well, I don't know, you know, church, we don't know. We, we you know, the scripture says that we prophesy in part and we know in part, amen. You know, so we, we really, we can see the signs of the times coming, amen, and we know that things are going to happen, but we, we can't tell all the details. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll die before the tribulation, amen. Maybe I will. I don't know. You don't know if you'll die. Maybe I'll die tomorrow. We don't know. Amen. But, you know, it, there's going to be times that we're going to step in that fiery furnace, amen, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, you know, we're not going to really know if God's going to deliver us. I mean, if we're honest, you know. And we can have that attitude that, you know, that we believe that God is going to deliver us. But really, if we're honest, we really don't know until that deliverance comes in. And we really don't know. But we, we can have that attitude, believe that God is going to deliver us, and we can have that attitude that says, you know, even if He don't deliver us, we won't bow in this day. And then we need to have that conviction in our life. Yes, we do. You know, uh, and if, if, uh, there's that old adage, and I've heard it, I don't know, for, I don't know how long, but, if, but I've, I've, I've heard different preachers preach it. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And that's a good question to ask yourself. Would there be enough evidence to convict us? Or would we just be one of a multitude of apostate people when that time comes? You know, whose God is really a, a demonic demon, and it's a God of order. And scripture says it's a whore who sets on many waters. That's what that's what the uh, false the the uh, well, the Antichrist and all them, you know, they're gonna be the scripture calls them a whore that sits on many waters. That's 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 a, a leader of many people, amen. And it's going to be a leader of an apostate church. Amen. That's what, that's what it is. It's going to be a leader of an apostate church. All you have to do is hear that music, amen, and bow. It's so easy. Amen. It's so easy. And it's, it's easy as, as Christians and as unbelievers to just go with the flow of everything in the world, amen. But it's hard to stand up. It's hard to stand up in a crowd of people that really are not believers or they're falling away and say, you know, I'm not going to bow, no matter what you do, you know, God will deliver you, but no matter what, I'm not going to bow. That's, that's a lot harder, amen. Scripture says, you know, be careful not to go down the wide path. You know, many, many take that path, amen, but the narrow path, you find that path, amen, you find the narrow path. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a destiny to go into that fire, and then they did. And they, they didn't know if they were coming out alive. They believe God, amen, and God said, if he does it, we will not bow. And they went, but there was an on-time God there waiting on them. Yes, hallelujah. And as, as uh, the brother spoke earlier, he said, you know, that was Jesus, amen. I, 
Jesus is all over the Old Testament, and he's all over the Old Testament. And a lot of people don't realize that, but he really is. 24 and 25, we're going to read that verse again. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men down into the midst of the fire? The answer was said to the king, True, O king. The answer said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the, the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. The Son of God. That was Jesus. And amen. Yes. You know, they, they were bound. They were bound and put into that fire. And uh, we're going to go into some fires in our life. Amen. We're going to be bound often when we go into the fires. But the question is, when we come out, we'll, we'll, we'll be, uh, you know, that fire, take that uh, out of us. You can say that, you, know, you can look at fire as a cleansing thing in the scriptures. When we get into the fires, what is it? It cleanses us. So whatever we're bound with, when we go into that fire as Christians, when we come out, amen, we should be unbound by that. Amen, we should be unbound by whatever it is that we went into. We should come out closer to God than what we went in. You know, I kind of look at this, this is a phrase that my wife uses, and I kind of like, I kind of like it, you know. She says, shackles on and shackles off, amen. And that's how it was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went in with shackles on, and they come out with shackles off. And if you read Nebuchadnezzar's attitude, it turned, it turned from anger to respect amen, for, for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because he couldn't deny, he couldn't deny the power and the presence of God. He couldn't deny that the power, the presence of Jesus was there. Amen. amen. And, and how many know that when we get in the presence of Jesus, you know, we're going to change. Amen. Our life's going to be changed forever. And old Nebuchadnezzar, he wasn't any different. Amen. He seen Jesus in that fiery furnace, and his life was changed forever. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into that furnace because they would not bow. Amen. They would not obey that king. Uh, they, they come out with the favor of the king, amen, the favor of the Lord and the favor of the king, amen. And how many know in life that sometimes that happens with us? We'll, we'll find favor of the king and then when we come out of fires. Yes. You know, we'll go through some fires in this life, but we go through coming out and you'll find favor with these people. And uh, there's always some that are plotting the next thing. If you read the story, what happens to Shadrach, Meshach, and Benico? Their troubles weren't over, amen. Their troubles weren't over. There was more people that were plotting and stealing to harm them. They were plotting and stealing to do anything they could against God. And that's how it is in our life, too. Amen. We'll come out of fire, but amen, we gotta be we gotta be alert and conscious because we know amen, the enemy's still there. Amen. The enemy's still there. You know, we're gonna have some devils that's gonna try to put put us in fire, say amen. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, church, the last three three days or so. I've been in some fires. <laughs> amen. I've had some devils on me. Amen. But you know what? I got deliverance today. Amen. I got deliverance in my car. Amen. I'm, 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 I'm like you, brother, man. I'm really, I'm right in my body. Amen. The Lord delivered me. And then the Lord delivers the afflictions of the righteous. Amen. You hear that cry. Amen. And you need second Peter. Second Peter. Amen. Yeah. Chapter 2, verse 9. Yeah. It says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and yeah. to preserve the unjust unto the judgment to be punished. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. We're going to have the devils in our life. Amen. But yeah. we can stand knowing, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Amen. We're not careful to answer these in these matters. Meaning, I don't have to think twice about this one. Amen. 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 We don't have to think twice when we answer this one. That we, we're not going to battle, amen. And even if the Lord don't deliver us, we still won't battle. Amen. That's got to be our mindset. And I pray it is, amen. Because we're all going to be tested in the refiner's fire. Amen. And we do, we're going to come out come out of that pure. Yes. You know, we're going to come out of that more pure and more fit for the service of the Lord. Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. Amen. You know, <laughs> There's, there's three camps of thought on the tribulation. You know, you got pre-tribulation, tribulation, you got mid-tribulationists, you got post-tribulationists. Me and Pastor, we're, we both agree we're, we're pre-tribulationists. And, we and uh, I kind of look at this like pre-tribulations, well, God won't allow anything bad to happen to me. Amen. Life's all roses and candy. mid tribulations well, God's going to allow us to suffer a little bit, so about halfway is good for me, amen. 
And then the post strippers, well, I'm going to suffer just like Jesus did. Amen. And that's what we deserve. That's my way of kind of lighting up a subject that really people get heated. Amen. Christians really get heated over, over the rapture and tribulation. They really do. But, uh, you know, I don't know what Zane's opinion is. I've never really heard him say. But, uh, and I've never asked him. But, you know, maybe, maybe he's a bit tribulationist. So am I going to I can go up to Zane and say, well, you're a big tribulationist. I, 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 I think you're apostate. <laughs> no, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm like, wow, you know, tell, tell, me, tell, me, uh, tell me tell me, what your verses are. You know, I, I'm going to ask because, you know, I said earlier, we, we don't have all revelation. No, no one has all revelation. Yeah, we see in part, we hear in part. And, 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 and we, we don't even prophesy like the old prophets of old did. I mean, they, they prophesied. The actual living, breathing word of God. Yes. But when we prophesy today, I mean, we prophesy the word that's already been written. Amen. When we prophesy today, so prophecy for us is different. So we we have the written word. We have it, and anything that comes to us in visions and dreams and prophecies and stuff like that, it's going to come right back in here. I've never seen God prophesy to anybody that you can't go right back to the scripture and find the exact same thing. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's that's right. right. You might not know it. You might not know, you know, recognize it. But if you, if you start asking some other people and you start researching, I guarantee you that that, that prophecy from God, you're going to find it in the scriptures. Because that's the way God works. But, and like I said, you know, I, I would ask him, you know, well, what, you know what, what do you believe and why? And I, and I, I would legitimately be interested to hear. Because I'm always learning. Amen. I'm always learning. Uh, not you know, not many died not having a clue. You know, if, if you look in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament, when the, when the prophets prophesied, you know, a lot of them died. They didn't even know what they prophesied. They died not knowing. You know, because why? Because one prophecy reveals a, a previous prophecy. You know, and so sometimes they just died and they didn't know what they prophesied. They, they were sealed up to the end, like in Daniel prophecies. They were sealed up, so they they just didn't really know the answer. But I'll tell you, for me, I find the answer in the Jewish wedding, amen. And they say, boy, that's actually weird. How can you see it in the Jewish wedding? But you know, in the Jewish wedding, you have the bride and the groom, and they, and they, they have their, their agreement, amen. And they, and they part just like us Christians and Jesus is. Jesus goes and prepares a house for us, amen. The bride, the bride and groom goes and prepares a house for the groom. They're separated from each other for a period of time. And then they come together, they have a ceremony, and they go into the bride room, the marriage chamber, amen. And they're locked up in there for seven days. Seven days, and then the bride and the groom is a Jewish wedding, and they come out and have a big feast. Okay, and Jesus uses these exact same symbols in the scriptures to say how it's going to be. He's going to come get his bride, he's going to take him up to heaven, and then and then at, at, at later there's going to be a wedding feast. Amen. So, I, and how, how long was how long are they in his bridal chamber? Seven days. How long does the tribulation last? You know, some some scriptures say seven years, but there's other other scriptures that says it's seven years, but it says seven days. Seven days. seven days represent seven years in, in these matters. I know it's kind of complicated, but in the scriptures, you, you just know the seven days in the tribulation is seven years. Amen. So I see that, and I see, I see that happening, that we're going to be ratcheted up in the bridal chamber for seven years. Amen. While that tribute, so all hell literally is breaking loose on this earth. Amen. I don't want to be here. Amen. I don't. But, we'll, we'll, you know, will people be saved in tribulation? I, I say they will, but... They'll go from being saved on down to the line. They'll be like a cattle in a, in, in a slaughterhouse. Yes. Amen. They're going to go, I won't take the mark, and they're going to be put into a cattle chute and off to be beheaded. So, when, you know, the ones that are saved in the, in the tribulation, pretty much, they're going to have a very short lives. <laughs> they're going to be beheaded. You know, people love to gamble. Have you ever noticed that? People love to gamble. Oh, they love to gamble with their money, and they love to gamble with a lot of things. They do. I see people spend, you know, $300 on lottery tickets in their building. And they, matter of fact, I've seen, I've worked with guys that got their paycheck, blew it all over, sloppish. I, I, Pastor, I have a hard time understanding that. I guess I was never much of a gambler. I can't think of it. I never much, I really didn't even, I, I mean, I don't buy lottery tickets, but even in my business, I rarely bought lottery tickets. So just, you know, to me, it's something for nothing. It, but you're probably not going to get it anyway. If you did, it was something for nothing. But people love to gamble. They love to gamble with their lives and their souls. You know, and we, we can't say that the tribulation is going to start, can't start tomorrow, but it might, amen. 
I mean, I, I think that we're there. Who, who knows? If every day people die unexpectedly. Amen. How many, how many people have we seen die in motorcycle wrecks this, this summer? Yeah. I was thinking about the other day. Man, I've seen a lot of people die in motorcycle wrecks. I guarantee none of them woke up thinking today's the day I die. I mean, they just went. Amen. They died unexpectedly. You know, if your heart's right, you don't really give it a second thought, amen. You don't. Uh, if your heart's wrong and you don't give it a second thought, well, you better check your heart, amen. But the scripture says that God, He takes no delight in fools. And then people that gamble with their souls, you kind of foolish, amen. You don't take delight in fools. You know, we know in part and we prophesy in part. Uh, pre trib, mid trib, or post lib trib. I mean, I can assure you this God's going to be an on time God. Amen. He's going to be right on time. He's going to be right on the time that He sees fit and not when we see fit. And in the tribulation, He's going to be an on time God. When Israel was in Egypt, He had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going through the fire. In our daily lives, in the coming apocalypse, amen. God's going to be an on time God that He just is now. But in this matter, we're not careful to answer, amen. If it be so, God is able to deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O King, we will not serve your gods nor worship your golden images, amen. Do you believe that? Amen. Do you, you believe that in your life? I, I mean, I pray that we all do, amen. Because we serve an on time God. He's not early, He's not late, He's right on time, amen. And uh, if you're on YouTube tonight, I just got a short little message for people on YouTube. I don't really usually do this, but I felt no. If you're on YouTube tonight and you're not saved, amen, it's time to get right with the Lord. Amen. Jesus' is blood, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and then the blood cleanses us from unrighteousness. And then you, you know, you can be saved. If you're not saved on YouTube, you can be saved. I mean, you need to repent, amen, and believe in Jesus. Amen. Yes. Find, you find yourself a good church to go into. I mean, you know, God will lead you. you just if you, if you get saved and you ask the Lord to deliver you and send you to the right church, amen, he'll do it, amen. You know, God's kind, kind-hearted, he's long-suffering, amen, but time is short. I mean, do you believe that, church? Do you really believe that time is short? I do. And I do, brother. I believe the time is very short. And I believe the rapture is right, is, is right around the corner, amen. And when it does come, it's going to be right on time. Amen. Make sure that you're not gambling with your soul. Amen. Not gamble with your life. You know, be ready for the Lord to come. You know what? If, if, if we die before the Lord comes, praise God. We'll be yeah, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. We ain't lost nothing. Amen. We ain't lost nothing. Be ready. We ain't lost nothing. Yes, sir. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't bow. Amen. That's yeah. the way we got to be, church. Amen. Yeah. If anyone needs prayer, we'll pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's a good service, amen. Yes, thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Good word. Amen. Yes, I love the Lord. Amen. You want any prayer? <coughs> oh, we got a group of ladies out there. Yeah, yeah. That's still good. That's He preserves. 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 He